Uh, today, uh, we have uh, Jordan van Gestel and Jonathan uh, Howard. Uh, before, um, I, I'm Katerina Carmo. I'm a postdoc uh, at Luis Teixeira Lab in working on host microorganism uh, interaction. And today, I will be your host, and I uh, would like to, to introduce uh, Jordi. Um, so Jordi uh, is a evolutionary biologist. He will soon uh, join EMBL. He studied biology uh, with a major in, in ecology and evolution at the University of Groningen in Netherlands. And in 2016, he completed a PhD where he studied evolution of bacterial cell differentiation and multicellular organization. His PhD research was conducted uh, at the University of uh, Groningen, working with uh, Franjo uh, Weising and Oscar Coopers, and also at Harvard uh, University, where he worked with Roberto Coulter and Martin Novak. Jordi is interested in the evolutionary origins of organization and cooperation. He did a first postdoc uh, at both University of Zurich with Andreas Wagner and uh, ETH Zurich with Martin Ackman. And he is now at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, working with uh, Carol Gross. His studies uh, demonstrated that uh, we can learn a lot from bacteria, uh, how bacteria survive in their complex worlds, and uh, that by studying bacteria, we might have a new way uh, to think uh, of evolution. So today, um, uh, Jordi will talk about uh, quorum sensing and horizontal gene transfer in uh, bacterial communities. Thank you very much, Jordi. Thank you very much, Katerina, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, thanks everybody for the invitation for, to, to the seminar series. I'm very excited to be here and tell you about my work on quorum sensing and its role in regulating horizontal gene transfer. Um, please feel free to interrupt whenever you have a question, just unmute yourself and make some noise because I cannot see all the screens on my small laptop here. So as many of you will know, quorum sensing is a form of cell-cell communication that is widely observed among bacteria where cells secrete small signal molecules in the environment, which they can also sense, either through receptors on the membrane or receptors in the cytoplasm. And so as the cell density increases, the signal concentration will increase, and this allows cells to respond to the change in cell density by changing gene expression. And so quorum sensing is used to actually regulate a broad range of phenotypes, including virulence factors, biofilm formation, competence, uh, CRISPR-Cas immunity, et cetera. And it's typically assumed that these small signal molecules broadly diffused in space and therefore inform the cells about the overall density of signal producing cells in the community. At the same time, we know that if you look to multi-species communities uh, in nature, they often have a drastic change in the community composition at a very small spatial scale. And here I show you a beautiful image of the microbiome on the tongue epithelium, where every color represents a different species. And you can see if you move only a few oh. microns away, you go, Oh, sorry. Wow, I said. Oh. <laughs> right. Yeah, you can see if you move a few microns away, you go from a completely blue region to a completely red region. And so I was curious to know if, if quorum sensing systems can also act locally and therefore be used by the cells to inform themselves about local changes in the community composition. And so in order for a quorum sensing system to act locally, a signal diffusion somehow has to be limited. And one mechanism to achieve this would be active signal uptake. And indeed, besides the classical quorum sending systems where signal molecules are sensed by a receptor and released again, which I will call the non-absorbing quorum sending system, you have a large class of absorbing quorum sending systems where signal molecules are irreversibly taken up by the cell after which they're being sensed. And so based on mathematical modeling, you can show that if the cell density is high enough, the signal uptake rate can overwhelm the signal diffusion rate, and this will lead to extraordinary short ranges of communication. And since it has never been observed before, we decided to actually test this hypothesis uh, using a synthetic community of signal producing and signal receiving cell that we engineered in Bacillus cellulose. And so basically all we have is a producer that's blue and a receiver that's red. To produce will secrete signal at a constant rate, these signal molecules can then diffuse and can be sensed by both the receiver and producer. 
And both these cell types will express a yellow fluorescent protein in response. So we are fully informed in response. So we are fully informed about the community. We know which cells produce the signal, which receive the signal, and we can also infer the signal concentration by looking to the YFP expression. Then to mimic the high cell densities that we observe in, uh, in natural communities, we make use of a microfluidic setup where we have a chip with main flow channels for which you flow medium at a constant rate. And at the lateral side of those flow channels were these very shallow chambers. And we can load cells inside those chambers and then use microscopy from above here to keep track of those cells and observe how they communicate with each other. So since you can flow medium to this, this flow channel at a constant rate, cells are exposed to constant environmental conditions. There's no actual flow in the, in the chamber. So here, dynamics are determined by signal production, uh, uptake, and diffusion. So this is how a chamber looks like. It fits about 1,400 cells. And so as cells divide, they're kind of being pushed out of the chamber and washed away with the main flow in the flow channel. So now we can start loading producers and receivers. And again, we can do a time lapse. And then simply by turning on the YFP channel, we can observe uh, or infer the signal concentration. And so if we do that here, we see a high signal concentration on the right end of the chamber where there are the producers. And then towards the left side of the chamber, we get this gradual decline in signal concentration. And so it's this decline in YFP expression that we can use to quantify the communication range. And so we use this exact same setup to quantify the communication range of one classical non-absorbing quorum sending system and uh, of two absorbing quorum sending systems. And so let's first have a look at the uh, non-absorbing system. So like expected, we see that uh, in a, the non-absorbing system, uh, signal molecules diffuse far out. And so basically all the cells in the chambers express YFP. And if we then uh, ex plot the YFP expression as in relation to the distance of a cell towards the boundary between producer and receivers, we can get this plot here. And so the dashed vertical line shows the boundary. And then you can see here this very shallow decline in the signal response uh, over space. Then if we compare this to the absorbent quorum sending systems, we get drastically different results. And so basically there's no YFP expression on the right side of the chamber. And we get this very steep decline in space. And so a very strong reduction in the, in the YFP expression. And if we quantify the uh, length scale of communication, it's only 13.4 micrometers for the system in the middle and 5.5 micrometers for the system on the right. And as a reference, the cell is about five to 10 microns in length. So there's really extraordinary short ranges of communication. Somebody muted me. <laughs> um, so here we quantify the range of communication based on uh, the signal response, but we can also try to infer the actual signal concentration. And for this, we need to know uh, how the signal concentration affects the YFP expression. And fortunately for both absorbing quorum sending systems, we can chemically synthesize the signal molecules. And so we can actually determine the signal response curves for both of these, uh, for both of these systems uh, using batch cultures. And so I'm showing those signal response curves here. So here on the X axis, you have the signal concentration that we then manipulate ourselves. And then on the Y axis, you see the signal response. And then what is important in this plot in this in signal response curve is a slope of this curve. And so when the slope here, which is called the Hill coefficient is one, it means that a doubling in signal concentration also results in a doubling of YFP expression. And so for the system in the middle here, you see that the Hill coefficient is nearly one. And so we can read this slope more or less like the change in signal concentration in space. For the system on the right here, we see that the slope is steeper. And so it means that one log fold increase in signal concentration results in about a 2.2 log fold increase in signal response. And, and so this also explains why we see a steeper slope here and also why we kind of have a constant YFP expression and a sudden drop in YFP expressions, which kicks in relatively late. And so you see that partly these dynamics here are the results of how the cells respond to the signal and if we correct for this and determine the signal concentration, you still see a relatively steep slope, but it's, it's weakened compared to the response that we see here. Nonetheless, the take home message is that the reason why we get uh, the strong reduction here is because the signal concentration declines. And so the second step will be to determine if the signal uh, uh, concentration declines because of 
uptake of the sigma molecules from the environment. And for this, we'll use the system in the middle that shows a linear response curve. And we simply manipulated the uptake rate by changing the expression of the system that's responsible for signal uptake. And so these sigma molecules here are small uh, peptides. And so the uptake systems are oligopeptide permeases. And so if we increase the expression of the oligopeptide permease, uh, we actually get a shorter communication range. And so this confirms our hypothesis that signal uptake is responsible primarily for reducing the communication range. So that's great. So now we can start testing the system and see how it behaves under different conditions. And so the first thing we wanted to do is to see uh, for this kind of short range communication system, how does the cluster size correlate with the signal concentration inside the cluster? And so the way we can do this is by comparing different chambers with different cluster sizes and see how the size of the cluster for which we use the width of the cluster correlates with the average YFP expression inside the cluster. And so based on mathematical modeling, you would expect the following pattern. Initially, you expect, oh, well, I gave it away already now, but initially you expect a proportional increase uh, with the cluster size and the YFP expression inside the cluster. But then if clusters become larger than the communication range, which is a vertical dashed line here, you expect the signal concentration to saturate uh, to a certain asymptote that's given by the signal production rate over the signal uptake rate. Um, and so we can validate this by looking to the uh, clusters and indeed like, like expected, we see this uh, uh, pattern nicely being followed by our experimental data. With one exception, namely very small clusters consisting of single cells like the one here have a slightly higher YFP expression than we expect mathematically. Um, and we actually have the indication that this is actually the result of a small degree of self-sensing by those signal producers. The important take home message here is that the short range communication range communication systems can only be used by the cells to sense the difference in cluster size for relatively small clusters. When clusters become much bigger, uh, there is no change in signal concentration anymore. And so a signal producing cells cannot sense the difference between being in a cluster of 50,000 or 50 million cells. They same, sense the same uh, signal concentration. And this is distinct for the non-absorbent quorum sending systems. Next, what we wanted to do is to look to more complex spatial configurations. And so we looked at chambers with multiple clusters. And so here in this, in this particular example, we have a chamber with a large cluster of signal produced on the right side, uh, a much smaller cluster on the left side, and a very small cluster in the middle. And based on the communication range, we can mathematically predict what is the expected signal concentration in space, which is shown here uh, by this smooth surface. And what it shows us is that there is no interference between communication on the left side of the chamber and the right side of the chamber. In other words, a blue cell here is unaware of the presence of this much larger, larger cluster, I'm sorry, larger cluster of signal producing cells on the right side and vice versa. And so this means that the short range communication really informs the cells about neighboring cells only. And again, we can validate this by looking to the YFP expression which, which nicely fits the mathematical prediction. Uh, we can even take this a step further. So if we take this plot and uh, uh, superimpose the expression inside of these clusters in the previous plot I showed you before, you see that nicely follow the, the white line here. And so it's as if these clusters occur by themselves in, in the chamber, uh, not with other clusters. And so, Given that short range communication only allows you to sense your neighbors, this raises the question, uh, what is the benefit of only sensing your neighbors? And to address this question, we wanted to look to phenotypes that strictly rely on the physical interaction between cells, because the reason that for those phenotypes, it's particularly beneficial to only sense your neighbors. And one such phenotype is conjugation. So as everybody knows, conjugation is a form of uh, horizontal gene transfer where a, a cell, for example, with, a, with a, a plasmid has to make physical contact with a recipient cell in order to transfer the plasmid or a copy of the plasmid to its neighbor. And so you will have a donor and a recipient. And it's known uh, from previous studies on batch cultures that many of those, quorums, uh, many of those uh, conjugative systems are actually regulated through quorum sensing. And the way this happens is as follows. If you have a population, in which many uh, cells carry the plasmid, which encodes a quorum sensing system, 
the signal concentration will be high because all these cells will be produced in the quorum sank system, and this will suppress the induction of conjugation. Conversely, if you have a population in which very few cells carry the plasmid, there will be very few signal producers, there will be a low signal concentration, and this will trigger the induction of conjugation. And this way of regulating conjugation is beneficial because you only want to try to conjugate uh, if there are potential recipient cells that do not carry the plasmid yet. And so we, we, we thought it would be interesting to study this particular system in a spatial context, because since conjugation is only possible with directly neighboring cells, it's particularly beneficial to know if your direct neighbors carry the plasmid or not. So you want to have short range communication. And so the test is, we decided to look to the ice element in Bacillus cellulis, which is the integrative communicative element, uh, which is more or less like a plasmid system that gets integrated into the chromosome. And this uh, ice element encodes uh, a single uh, absorbing quorum sending system. And so this, this system secretes signal molecules that suppress the induction of conjugation. And so what we'll be looking at is a, a community that consists of cells with the ice elements in blue and cells without the ice element in red. Those, those cells with the ice element have the quorum sending system, so they will produce the signal molecule. These will diffuse out that will be taken up by both the, uh, the, the cells without the ice element and with the ice element because signal uptake is a property of the host, another property of the uh, conjugative element. And then we will keep track of the induction of conjugation. And so in this case, YFP expression is not uh, indicative of the signal concentration, but of the induction of conjugation. And so we expect uh, at high signal concentration to have a suppression of YFP expression because there will be no induction of conjugation. So if you take the previous scenario back, the left case scenario would be a blue cell that's surrounded by other blue cells. They all have the ice element, so they all produce a signal. It will be high signal concentration, therefore no uh, YFP expression, no induction of conjugation. In the right case scenario, we'll have a blue cell surrounded by red cells. There will be a relatively low signal concentration, and this will trigger the induction of conjugation. At least that's what we hypothesize and result in YFP expression. Uh, importantly, we use a mutant here, so the ice element cannot actually spread, and so we're sure that the red cells never contain the ice element. And so we merely look to the induction and not the actual transfer of the ice element. So the first thing we did uh, using the system is we first quantified the communication range. And uh, consistent with the previous observation, also this absorbing quorum sending system showed a very short range of communication only 4.2 micrometers. And so this means that in this small neighborhood of 4.2 micrometers, uh, the community composition in small neighborhood determines whether or not a cell would induce conjugation or not. And so the test is we'll look to this mixed communities uh, of which I will show an example here. So here we have the cells with the ice element in blue, then in red we have the cells without the ice element. And then below I show you exactly the same frame but instead of showing the blue fluorescent protein, I'm showing uh, the expression of the YFP. And so there's an indication of the induction of conjugation. And so we can keep track which of those blue cells uh, actually triggers conjugation. And what you can appreciate if you look at this movie is that cells close to the red cells are more likely to induce conjugation than cells uh, that are surrounded by blue cells. And in fact, we, we also quantified this. And so we looked at more than 80,000 blue cells and we determined what is the relationship between the fraction of red cells in the local neighborhood and the induction probability of conjugation. And you see that if you go from a neighborhood only consisting of blue cells to a neighborhood only consisting of red cells, you have a 200 fold increase uh, in the induction, of, induction probability of conjugation. And so this, this example nicely illustrates that short range communication can be beneficial to regulate the physical interaction between cells. And by this, I'd like to end the first part of my talk by, by a, a couple of take home messages. What I showed you is that signal uptake results in short range communication, which allows for neighborhood sensing, which is quite distinct from quorum sensing. And in fact, many bacterial species have both absorbing and non absorbing quorum sensing systems, which means that they could potentially integrate both local and global information about the community composition. Then I showed you that this can be used to regulate horizontal gene transfer. I showed you an example of, of conjugation. Uh, we also uh, showed in our paper an example of, of uh, phage, uh, decision-making phages, which also rely on quorum sending as well, between the lysogenic and the lytic life stage. And they have to make a similar decision, do I want to spread or do I want to stay in the host? And so if you're surrounded by cells that also are infected by the phage already, 
you don't want to be in the lytic stage. And so they will uh, suppress this induction. And they use also the short range communication to regulate this. Um, and I think a very important take home message overall from this, this work is that it's very important to understand uh, microbial interactions in a natural context, which will help us to understand uh, functioning of such quorum sending systems and the functional implications of those systems uh, in the natural environment. And, and this type of work really made me think about this uh, more broadly uh, and, and raised the question for me, what other microbial interactions matter for, for understanding uh, bacterial behaviors and microbial functioning? And this triggered my more recent work, uh, which is on predation. And so predation is, is a very dominant factor in many natural ecologies uh, and, and it's a very strong selection pressure. And so here I show you a small video that I made where you see uh, dictostelium uh, grazing on a lawn of bacteria. And in only a matter of half an hour, most of these bacterial cells get eaten away. And so it's, a, it's an immense selection pressure that will shape the evolution of those bacterial uh, cells that are exposed to predation. And there's been also been experiments done in, in, with natural communities. And so if you take a soil community of bacteria and simply add a single amino predator, in a matter of three days, 60% of this community is eaten away. And so you get a 60% reduction in biomass. And you also get a massive shift in the species composition of those communities. And it's because these amino predators have a certain preference for certain prey, and also because certain prey species are resistant against predation. Conversely, there's also a very strong selection pressure on the protozoans or predators themselves. And so typically a, a single protozoan cell has to consume between a few hundred and a few thousand bacterial cells for a single cell division. And so there's always selection pressure for those protozoans uh, to, to evolve better mechanisms to prey and hunt on, on bacterial cells. And so this results in an interesting co-evolution between the protozoans and the bacteria. And so this, just to give you an impression how strong this selection pressure can be, I want to show you a very simple experiment that I uh, recently done in the lab of Kara Gross, where I'm currently working at UCSF. And so what I did is I plated out some acetylcellular cells on an agar plate in the form of a lawn, and then I sprinkled some dicty spores on top. And so those spores germinate, they start eating the bacterial cells, and in a matter of a week or so, most bacterial cells are eaten away, and you see the dictostelium starts forming these small fruiting bodies here. These, these look like hairy structures on the surface. But you also see numerous small colonies that somehow resisted being preyed upon. And so what I did, I sequenced those colonies. What we find is that we have a lot of different mutations in different genetic pathways, potentially affecting the interaction between bacillus cellulose and dictostelium. And I just want to highlight some of those examples here. So two mutations we find in, is, is in the stress response and, and in colony formation. And both of those, we suspected affect uh, the ingestion of bacillus cellulose by uh, dictostelium. And so one mutation uh, is in the regulator of the SOS stress response or SOS response and results in SOS filamentation, so longer cells. And so we predicted this will make it impossible for dictostelium to eat the cells. Another mutation we found was in a regulator of biofilm formation. And this was actually a suppressor. So by having a knockout of the suppressor, you get stronger biofilm growth. And we hypothesized this makes it harder for dictostelium to eat away the cell. And so we can confirm this by simply looking at those mutants under the microscope. And so here you have the mutant that is actually uh, involved in biofilm formation. And so this mutant actually has both filamentation and very strong clumping. So this looks a bit ugly, but this is actually a clump of cells strongly adhering to each other. And what you will see is that it's very hard for dictostelium to eat away the cells from this clump. And in fact, eventually they will leave those clumps uh, and won't eat them at all. I'm going to replay this because it's the first time I saw dictostelium also deciding to spit out the bacterial cell after trying to consume it, which looks a bit interesting to me. So you see here, it's trying to phagocytize, but it eventually doesn't do it. Uh, here on the right, this is the mutant that actually is part of the SOS response. And so um, in many bacterial species, actually, even in gram negatives, there's a phenomenon called SOS filamentation. And so you get this very elongated cells and, and also here we see that this elongation of cells prevents dictostelium from eating away uh, the bacteria. So even at this very high density of dictostelium, uh, these cells survive. And so basically it shows that this kind of conserved regulatory mechanisms uh, have functional implications for surviving predation. 
And so I want to highlight two more mutations. So one mutation we found, or a set of mutations, I have to say, we find in, uh, find in tachoic acid biosynthesis. And so tachoic acids are expressed in the membrane of cells, and they're often used by uh, protozoans, but also by our immune system to recognize bacteria. And so macrophages in our immune system use toll like receptors that bind tachoic acids, and, and this way they, they eliminate bacterial cells from our body. And similarly, dictostelium has proteins that resemble toll like receptors. And so we hypothesize that mutants in the tachoic acid biosynthesis might allow bacillus cellulose to evade detection and therefore survive predation. And then we also find mutations in polyketide biosynthesis. And these are toxins involved in competition between bacterial cells. And we hypothesize it might also be involved in uh, killing dictostelium or other protozoan predators and therefore evading predation. So these are just a few examples, but I think it will be, it's interesting to actually zoom out from this and think about this more broadly. And so if you look to the, the eukaryotic tree of life, we actually find an overwhelming diversity of, of uh, predators that, that specialize in eating bacterial prey. And in fact, uh, predation is one of the dominant relationships between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And so all the major uh, clades in the eukaryotes contain uh, predators that, that specialize in eating bacterial prey. And some of them really almost solely consist of predators. And just to highlight this diversity, if you look to only the amoebozoa, they're, they're much more diverse in terms of genetics than, than the metazoans are. And so it's been an incredible diversity of predators eating on bacterial prey. And likely these predators impose very distinct selection pressures on the bacterial communities of which they're part. And I think a very exciting uh, challenge for the future is to understand uh, this co-evolution between predators and prey and see how bacteria can escape predation while predators specialize on, on eating bacterial prey. And I'm happy to announce, like Katharina also mentioned already, that this fall I will be starting my lab at EMBL, working on these type of questions and, and similar questions on the evolution of microbial systems. And so for anybody interested in joining my team, uh, please feel free and don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, but this I wanted to end and, and thank a number of people. So I'd like to thank the people involved in the Quorum Sensing work, which was actually a collaborative effort between the lab of Arvidor Eldar at Tel Aviv University and Martin Ackerman at ETH Zurich. Uh, which involved uh, two, two uh, PhD students at the time. And then I also want to thank Carol Gross, uh, which is, uh, uh, I'm currently working with her on the predator prey systems. Uh, I want to thank the funding agencies and uh, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jordi. This was uh, wonderful. So, Maybe I'll break Sorry. this Zoom sound. Oh, mm -hmm. do I have someone? There was someone, no. Yes, Isabel. Hi, Jordi, that was really lovely. So it, in, um, I was just wondering if you think, so some, some years ago, we, we were uh, doing this sort of experiments of, uh, predation of bacteria, in this case, Ishrisha coli and the predator, if we can call it a predator, was a macrophage. And, and what, you know, in, in a very short period of time, what the E. coli turned out to do was to develop, to, to evolve two different phenotypes that looked very similar in, in essence to your filamentous uh, resistant to amoeba bacillus and, and the other strafes, uh, um, biofilm uh, alteration. So I was just wondering the extent to which you think these kind of responses, uh, evolutionary responses of, of uh, the bacillus to amoeba might be similar to the bacillus to macrophages. No, I think that's a, a great question. And so I think, so some, some people have been calling this like a training ground. And so, mm -hmm. so in a way the selection pressure results from, from this protozoan predation are, are to a certain extent similar to the selection pressures that they face uh, from our immune system. Um, and so it's indeed true that you expect like certain general mechanisms like biofilm formation is, is often beneficial to evade predation. And that's why so many of those strains are really good biofilm formers, right. but also strains that uh, pseudomonas and cystic fibrosis that are very effective in, in evading the immune system, also strong biofilm, uh, biofilm growers. So I expect to see parallels there. And I think it's that makes also the system, I think, interesting to look at to see to which degree uh, protozoan predation actually um, 
can potentiate the, the emergence of pathogenicity or potentiate yeah. the emergence of, of, of cells evading the immune system as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, may I? Katharina, may I ask? Oh, I can't hear Sure, anything. go on, yes, okay, please. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's very, very simple question. So I'll make a, a statement first. And, and that is uh, that, that, that there's really a very beautiful presentation. Congratulations, it was lovely. Oh, thank you so much. In many respects, lovely. You said that, that uh, DICT has toll-like receptors. You didn't quite say that, but you said something very like that. And I was very surprised because I had a look for those some time ago and stopped uh, looking when I couldn't find anything. What have they got? Yeah, so I, I said they have proteins resembling to like receptors. They don't actually have yes. to like receptors, yeah, right? True. So they have like about 115 of those. Uh, so they have actually the separation. So they have interleukin uh, receptors and uh, they have these uh, leucine rich repeats proteins yes. that, that often are compared to, to the to like receptors. They have about 150 of those. They're surface bound. And, are they surface bound? It's unclear for many of them, so it's a it's a good question. So I have to I have to be careful there. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for mentioning. Just saying, <laughs> thank you very much again for your lovely talk. Yeah. Nasus, please. Sure. So, so Jordi, I was thinking on on the on the conjugation basically being uh, repressed by the short range uh, quorum sensing. So this is very good to separate other cells around you that have the conjugation system already, have the plasmid already in, but you cannot differentiate if there's uh, cells around that don't have the plasmid or there is no cell around. So it's a very good point. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a very good point. And so it's interesting, like it's, it's going to depend a bit on what is the most likely scenario that they face in their natural environment. And so if they're often part of communities, then you could say, uh, selection could still result in this kind of regulation. Uh, if they face both environments, they will be misinformed in one environment and correctly informed in the other environment. And so you can get malfunctional behaviors in a way. And so I think it's a, the challenging part would actually to be try to look at this, these systems in a natural environment and, and see like how often they actually like function adaptively and how often they're actually non-adaptive. Um, so yeah, it's a, a good point. You have a question from Roberto. You're off, you're muted. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. yeah yes. I can hear you. Very nice talk, uh, Jordi. Thanks. The question is related with the uh, NASA's one. So do you think this um, possible maladaptation that you were talking about could be compensated by the fact that perhaps only a small percentage of the population uh, reacts like that. So if not all cells that are capable of engaging in conjugation do it, that prevents uh, at least uh, an appearance of mutants taking over. So I wonder if, if a, a phenotypic variation in the expression of those genes could be the, the, the bed hedging uh, strategy for, for preventing this uh, uh, behavior to be maladaptive. I'm not sure if I completely understand. So, so you mean like a fraction so, of, the, of the... So, so uh, let me clarify. So when, when you see the beautiful uh, pictures of the chamber, you can see that there's a chance that cells that are surrounded by the red cells uh, activate uh, 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 conjugation, but you don't see that a big fraction of them activate conjugation. So there's still cells that are next to uh, the red yeah. one that don't do it. So perhaps that's the, the it's a bad hedging strategy. So that only a small percentage of the population does it. So even if it's maladaptive for that small percentage of the population, maybe for the entire population it's not that bad because in case, is that that uh, conjugation results beneficial for the for the entire uh, population? These guys can keep growing, and if it's not beneficial, it's only a small. Percentage. I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. So so it's indeed like it's not it's not a hundred percent. So indeed, if you're it's not every cell surrounded by red cells that will induce conjugation, and so it's a certain probability. And this is we think is part of the regulatory aspect of of the system, and so it's not a, a determinist system. 
It's, I mean, this will definitely reduce the cost if you do it in a maladaptive way. So if you try to conjugate with a lower probability, you expect a lower cost, but it would still be a futile trial for conjugation. So it's, it's, it's hard to say like what the exact cost would be in terms of fitness. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a good question, actually. I don't know. And so in the, the, the real system is also slightly more complicated. So now I highlighted the quorum sensing aspect. Normally also like uh, DNA damage also is involved in, in the induction of conjugation. So there's multiple signals that are being integrated at the same time. Uh, and, and so I can imagine it also nutrient conditions and, and, and other scenarios that might be associated with living in high cell densities might also be involved. And so cells could inform themselves in a more sophisticated way than only using the quorum sensing system. Uh, which would help actually trigger this in an adaptive way. Yeah. And, and are you expecting, because another uh, uh, angle on this is that these guys can transform uh, uh, any DNA that is around the, uh, them. They can just eat up DNA and introduce it into their chromosome. So perhaps these uh, failed attempts of conjugation might pay off in the near future if, if another cell passed by and, and capture that DNA. And if, if that would be a possibility, maybe a, a, a strains that are not capable of uh, transforming would behave differently. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know about that. The, the normal competence system depends on long range communication in bacillus cell. It's like the COMEX system. And so that's not a short range version. And so that's interesting. So they, they rely on the overall uh, signal production uh, density uh, in the community and not on the neighbors only. And so that's regulated differently. Yeah. Thank you, Jordi. Yeah. Thank you, uh, everybody. And uh, Jordi, thank you so much for uh, this really nice talk.